Welcome to Marketing Made Simple TV. My name is Jeff Ogden, the host of the show, and we're glad to have you back uh, for another week. And we've got a special show just for senior executives, CEOs, and boards of directors. We've got a great guest today, Ted Coyne. Ted is one of the most influential business leaders on Twitter today with a following of over 90,000 and growing rapidly. He's the founder of the Lead Biz community on Twitter, a forum that attracts some of the top minds in business leadership and in innovation. He's an inspirational speaker. He's the author of Five Star Customer Service and Spoil Em Rotten. And prior to writing his first book, he was the founder and CEO of Coin Language School, a B2B company that he brought from his living room to a $10 million valuation in just four years by focusing relently, relentlessly on customer service. And he lives in, uh, with his wife, two daughters, and his dog in Naples, Florida. So let's welcome Ted to the show. Hi, Jeff. Thanks a lot. I, I don't know where you got all those lies, but somebody was too kind to me. I don't know who wrote that stuff, but I found it, and I said, why not? Let's just use it. So anyway, but I'm, I'm glad to have you on the show, Ted. This is, we're going to have some fun. I agree. I agree. I'm really looking forward to this. So I'm going to start you off with the same question we ask every guest on the show, okay? Who are you? My name is Ted Corne. I help run a blog called Switch and Shift, which is uh, we're all about leadership in the 21st century. There are some tremendous changes underway. And what we're all about is helping companies understand whether it's whether you're motivated by the profit side or by the human side, whether you're altruist or just damn practical. We're all about helping you understand that if you treat people well, they will treat your stockholders well, you'll be more profitable. Companies that don't get that will probably be out of business, depending on the industry, in the next 10, maybe 20 years. So it's really, it's a, it's a play toward emotion on one side, do the right thing, but also profit on the other because it pays well. Interesting, Ted, that, that you say that uh, service pays well. So let's just, let's explore that, that idea that serve, you know, over serving your, your customer actually pays dividends. And I think you have some examples. Could you share some of these uh, stories with yeah, exactly. So we're running a series. Every every month we, we run a different theme. And this month we're running one on customer service. It's the first time in, in over a year that we've chosen that topic. We have some world-class authors and, and experts and business leaders who participated. So one of the comments that we got just last week was, hey, Ted, you wrote the opening post about some companies including Nordstrom. Read this in the Washington Post. I clicked through, and sure enough, Nordstrom, among others, is doing very, very well. Their stock is way up. Their profits are way up. And guess what? They give phenomenal service. And some of the other comments in the post were about, well, you know, I know that I could buy my jeans at, at a much lower price someplace else, but I love going to Nordstrom because I know no matter where I go, when they have a store, I walk in, they are going to spoil me rotten. You can't beat that. And so the Nordstrom family is not too dumb. Their stockholders are even smarter. They understand that if you treat your people well, they will treat your customers well. And those customers are going to treat you well with increased profits. Interesting. I read a book quite some time ago that uh, the customer comes second. And uh, I kind of... You know, that's kind of the same idea, that if you treat your employees really well, they're going to take great care of customers. So let's let's explore some of this five-star service idea. You know, a lot of people say, well, if I really, you know, invest in my employees and treat them well, it's very expensive. I can't afford to do that in my business. How do you deal with that objection, that I can't afford to give five-star service because customers will take advantage? It is. It's expensive, so don't do it. But your competition will, and you'll go out of business. There, done. Now, that, that was a little uh, maybe uh, abrupt and cocky, so let's go back a minute. There's a, uh, a grocery chain. No matter where I go in the country talking about customer service, I use the example of Wegmans, which is based out of Rochester, New York. They're only in the northeastern United States. They're moving down to the D.C. area, but they haven't gone much beyond that. And 
Wegmans, they have a motto, which is employees first, customer second. So no matter where I go, I talk to an audience and I say, have you ever heard of this company, Wegmans? I'm about to give you some examples. And people raise their hands, even if it's just one or two, and they say, I wish Wegmans would come here. You go to their, <laughs> their office and you'll see some letters from customers. Please, we open one in Denver. We open one in Phoenix in Los Angeles. I live in Florida. I wish that they would come down here. Our grocery stores are fine, but they're not phenomenal. Wegmans has this incredibly mass following. They treat their customers very, very well. But there's only a few people in the Wegmans family. There's only maybe, I, I would have to imagine, 100 executives in the Wegmans company. 100 people cannot treat all of their thousands of customers each week very well. They need tens of thousands of employees to do that for them. So they treat their, their employees just, you can't even imagine how well. They don't spoil them with money necessarily. They just show their respect in many different ways. Well, the employees are so happy working for Wegmans and being taken care of by their company that really does value them that they bend over backwards. And if you don't fit that culture, if you don't want to serve customers well, okay, you wash out, which is uh, another another uh, topic I hope we delve into, uh, the whole idea of cultural fit. So Wegmans has this employees first, customer second. Maybe a lot of you know this from a book title from HCL Technologies out in India. It's one of the world's largest outsources of technology. And no matter how you feel about outsourcing uh, technology to, uh, to Indian companies, the book is a must read. So Vineet Nayar uh, took over as vice chairman a couple, uh, about a decade ago, and he instituted this same philosophy, employees first, customer second. They have taken a speltified kind of growing but not anything like their competition type of firm and turned it into a powerhouse. Again, same principle. So in completely different markets, completely different companies, completely different business models from stop to finish, they both of these firms treat their employees well, and the employees treat the customers well. The company grows as a result. It's, it's hard to argue with that. Interesting, Ted. That uh, you know, sir, that service really works. I, let's talk about. Okay, I'm running a business now, and it's doing okay. And I like what you're saying, right? I, I say, okay, I'm going to really start serving my employees and, and trying to do become a, a Nordstrom or a Wegmans or any of the other examples. What are the kinds of things people do? It's not just throwing around money. It doesn't have to be throwing around money at all. In fact, take this as an example. So you can talk about top of the market. Um, Nordstrom. You can talk about uh, a grocery store that may or may not be price competitive, depending on what you're shopping for, Wegmans. Uh, they, they are price competitive, but they're not rock bottom, okay? How about Chick-fil-A? Chick-fil-A is a fast food joint. They give better service to their customers, and their customers love them. When they go in, they're competing against McDonald's, Wendy, and Burger King. Give me a break. There is not a lot of money to pay people, you know, you can't pay people $20, $30 an hour. It's just impossible. They go out of business before they even open up the first door. So what they do instead is they respect the people who work there. You see the manager, the owner of the franchise, walking around, um, serving people's drinks, cleaning up tables. He doesn't say, you know, I'm, I'm too important for that. You over there with the apron, you go clean up that table while I stand here and look important. It isn't like that. My, uh, so what happened was when we moved to Naples, it's the first time that we ever lived near Chick-fil-A, and I made friends with the owner of the franchise, and he said, um, you know, I asked him, I said, okay, what's your secret? Because clearly these people really like working here. They're going well above and beyond it. It's, it's almost amazing what they do. Some of it is definitely technique. So, for instance, they say just habitually, they say my pleasure, rather than saying you're welcome or no problem, which is a phrase that I hate, by the way. Um, they say my pleasure. That makes people think, hey, it's my pleasure that you're helping me. Great. I love that. I love that you think that way. But those are the little technicalities that you can teach people. That's, that's one thing. But the spirit of I care about you. I'm the owner of this company, but much more than that, you're a person who is important to me. That gets across to all the employees. And I, I asked uh, a number of the employees, and then I asked 
my, my friend about this, and he said, this is the thing. I do care. A lot of these, you know, people, they come from all different backgrounds. Some of them come from not very good family situations. They know they can talk to me kind of like I'm their dad, even if I'm their same age. Some of them are kids. Some of them are my age. And I will try to help them if I can through any type of issue, just advice, just a shoulder to talk to. Now, that may seem a little touchy-feely to some managers, and it depends on your style, depends on your company, how you get away with stuff like that. But you don't have to be emotionally, uh, let's say, gung-ho supportive of your people and, and uh, cry with them. If you like, how about this one? Have lunch with them. Sit down, have lunch, and say, hey, how are your kids? Remember your kids' names. These are things where people say, wait a minute, my boss actually knows that my little girl is in fourth grade. Wow, I never knew that he even realized I had children. That's the type of thing that wins the heart and enthusiasm of your employees. It doesn't cost a dime. When I wrote Five Star Customer Service, that was the whole pitch. You can give Ritz service on Chick-fil-A prices if you choose. You can also charge Ritz prices if you prefer because it's up to you now. Very interesting, Ted. Now, um, when you have a Nordstrom or a Chick-fil-A, you've got to hire people that fit into the culture. How do companies go about finding people? I'm sure it's not the standard, okay, where did you work? And <laughs> How do you go about finding people who... Uh... Companies go about this in a number of different ways, which I love. I love the diversity of, you know, we all have strong cultures, but one company does it this way, another company does it this way. It, it is not all cookie cutter at all. I'll give you an example. Again, I hate to use uh, Nordstrom again, so I'll go on to Disney in a second. Nordstrom, what they'll do is... The general manager of the store will bring a couple of top managers and go into a city to live when they're about to open up a store. So that's what they did here in Naples. They, um, they knew they were opening up the store. They moved here three, four months ahead of time, and they just started banking. They started going to restaurants, you know, everything that you do in a normal life, uh, you know, bringing their dry cleaning in. And as they're setting up the store, whenever they find somebody who is giving great service, does not matter what their background is. It could be the bartender. They give them their card and they say, you know, we're going to be hiring soon and I'd really like to see you there at the, uh, at the open house when we start that. I will, um, you know, I'd love to talk to you more about working for Nordstrom. Because as Herb Kelleher of Southwest Airlines said, we don't teach our people customer service. Their parents do. You have to find people who are excellent at customer service, excellent at caring, and you can't teach them that. You can teach them the skills that they need to do their job well. That's something that any good training department can accomplish. So how am I a flight attendant? How am I a, uh, a baggage handler? Well, that's something that, sure, these are the ways to, to be good. How, how do I care about my customers and not just punch the clock and, and you know, file my nails when I'm uh, supposed to be making eye contact? No, impossible. So let's talk about culture, and let's talk about Disney. They have, they, they have a very you know, rigorous interview process, and they bring people in from around the world. There is actually a very high turnover at the beginning of work at Disney because people come there, and they either say, I have found my home. This place is amazing, and I'm so glad that I'm part of this. Or they say, whoa, whoa, whoa. I thought I wanted to work here, but this is a cult of happy people, and I don't want to be part of this cult. So they quit. Zappos, the uh, online retailer, takes it one further. In training, they say, all right, we've gone through training, a little bit more left, but if you leave now, we're going to pay you $2,000. Now, $2,000, that's pretty good for somebody, you know, uh, uh, just beginning work at a company. Just to walk away, they keep the people who want to stay. They say, you know, $2,000, I want to be part of Zappos. So that's how they weed people out. Culture is an ongoing thing. You, you screen for it as much as you can in your hiring process, and then you build it. You build it, you build it, you build it, you build it. Those are great examples. I love the Herb Kelleher story that, um, you know, we, we don't teach the stuff the parents do. You know? <laughs> we don't teach great service. Parents teach great service. And you're right. That's the mindset of, of the people. 
And uh, I, I like the idea, too, of, of you said Nordstrom goes into an area and just looks for people doing great service, great stories. So how can someone, again, I, I, if you're talking to a CEO or a board member here and we say, Ted, we like what you're saying. How do we go about getting there? What are the things we need to do? What do we? What are the takeaways that we can culture get from change? And that's really what we're talking about. Culture change is much, much harder than starting from scratch. It just is. Uh, when you have an organization that's kind of sick, turning that into an organization that's healthy is tough. So here's the thing: when I when I started teaching customer service, which was based on my experience and my background. Uh, my experience, you know, running my company, especially, I realized very quickly that I wasn't really teaching customer service. The skills come easily. I was teaching leadership, and it kind of drove me crazy that people would say, "Oh yeah, customer service. You need to talk to our people." No, Mr. President, Mr. CEO, Mr. Chief Operating Officer, Ms. Chairman of the Board. I I really need to talk to you. And so I came up with a formula, which is. If you have profits at the end, so the formula has to equal profits. How do you get there? Customer service is the part right before the profits. But that, again, is not actually the sweet spot. Leadership is key. It gets the whole thing going. The middle part is culture. Leadership directs culture and keeps it going. Leaders should be the cheerleaders and the chief storytellers of the company to, uh, to protect the flame of culture. And then culture is what makes the company strong. There can be weak culture, strong culture, but you see again and again, when a company has heavy profits for a long time, when they survive downturns, come on ahead, when they beat their competition, when they out-innovate, it's because they have an a culture that is geared towards success, geared towards beating the competition, not filling out forms and, and obeying processes, culture that is all about getting around systems that don't work rather than being hogtied by systems that don't work. Culture is everything in a company. So when I'm talking to the leader of a company or talking to a board, first thing, talking to a board, how long have you had your CEO, and how is your CEO positioned to take you into the next 10 years? That's that's a good question for any board. You can talk about legal issues, which I'm not an expert on. You can talk about financial issues, which I'm not an expert on. Or you can talk about profit issues, which is all about culture issues, which is all about leadership issues. That's what I talk about. Who's leading? And then what is that leader doing? Is that leader mixing with the people? In the 1930s, Hewlett and Packard created a company, and they created a way of management called lock, uh, managed by locking and records. Everyone, everyone knows the term, and no one uses it. It drives me insane. It, it actually literally, if, if I go insane one day, you'll know it's because I saw another manager pouring over a spreadsheet in his office when his people were right outside his door, and he was ignoring them. That's what will turn me insane eventually. No, that's fine. You're you're fine. No, it's uh interesting. It's um something as simple as walking around, saying hello, talking to people. You know, it's this isn't this isn't rocket science. It's not easy to do, but it's not rocket science. So, Jeff, that is that is an absolutely perfect point. Business done right is incredibly simple. It's not easy at all, but they're two different things. It's very simple. The people in your on your front line, in your value zone, as uh, Nayar of HCL says, the people in your front line, they are doing the actual work. They're in the value zone. They're providing value to your customers and to your stockholders. Those are the people that you need to support. Now, I know, Jeff, that you're a huge fan of servant leadership. Look at your org chart, and my guess is you need to flip it upside down. That is what leadership in a company should do. Flip it upside down. The CEO is at the very bottom. The frontline staff is at the top. How can I support the frontline staff? If you can accomplish that and actually make it true rather than lip service, that is how you're going to eventually make your culture stronger. It's going to take a lot of work, but you've got nothing better to do. 
That's a great mental image to, to bring the show more to a close here of an organization chart, which is normally like this, and we're going to flip it upside down, right, and put the frontline people on the top, and the CEO's job is to service those people. A great analogy. I, I could talk to you for hours, Ted, but unfortunately our show's not that long, so I'm going to ask you one final question. Is where People want to learn more about this topic and more about you and, and your existing books and your new, I know you're going to write a new book here in the near future. Where can people learn about you and Switch and Shift and all the stuff, your great stuff? Well, thank you. So I'm really excited about Switch and Shift. I could not be more excited. So uh, about a year ago, my, my friend Sean Murphy and I started a blog. We just said, you blog, I blog. Let's put it together see what happens. We were expecting, I believe, uh, I know I was, maybe hundreds of people to watch. Instead, Last month we had 30,000. It was just two of us writing, but it gets better than that because we have so many guest talented authors and guest, um, you know, CEOs, company chairmen, et cetera, who are participating in this blog. So the nice thing is, for one thing, we can sit back and, and let them do their writing. And for the other, we can, um, we can share their talent. We're building what we call right up front a league of extraordinary thinkers. The, comments on the post, the quality of the people who are participating in this, the posts themselves, the quality of talent who's uh, – some of the people behind me in my bookshelf have uh, have put posts up and they've been incredibly popular. It's a positive experience for everybody. I really hope that if you do one thing today, sure it would be nice if you hire me to, to speak to your company, but even better, go to Swish and Shift, just start reading. Subscribe if you like it. It's going to get better and better. I want to thank Ted Coyne of SwitchAndShift.com for being a great guest on the show. As he said, go to SwitchAndShift.com, check out the blog, and if you like it, subscribe. Before we go, we got to thank our sponsors because they do a wonderful job of making the show possible. Avatage is a great content marketing company. Go to Avatage.com. DigitalEthos.org, not .com, is an educational site, nonprofit, really good stuff. CommunicationStrategyGroup.com is brand telling, PR, really good company. Eloqua is the world's largest revenue performance management company. And lastly, Watch It Too provides this wonderful TV on the web platform that we use for the show. So go to WatchItTo.com. Marketing Made Simple TV premieres every Thursday at noon. So till next week, we'll see you next time on Marketing Made Simple TV.